smaller crowd than this morning. I know we got a lot of people traveling, but still appreciate everybody that did make it out. So as we settle in, our first song will be number 539, Higher Ground. As we get situated, I'm going to continue reading from Psalm 119. Focus our minds before we start uh, singing together and worshiping. Psalm 119, beginning in verse 137. The book reads, Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your rules. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all fairness, in, in, excuse me, and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forget your words. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever and your law is true. Trouble and anguish have found me out, but your commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I might live. So we're here to study together, encourage each other in worship, learn more about God's law, learn more about God's way, and how we could better serve him in our life. So let's sing number 539. We'll sing the first, second, and fourth verses of this song. Number 539, Higher Ground. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I don't know if we lost the screen for a second or got out of phase, but thanks for sticking with me, everybody. What's that? Yeah. It's tricky sometimes. There's a lot going on with that one. Number 681, more holiness give me. Let's sing this one before we have our scripture reading and opening prayer. Number 681, more holiness give me. Hmm. More holiness give me, more strivings within, more patience in suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense in His care, more joy in His service, more purpose in prayer, more gratitude to give me, more trust in the Lord, more pride in His glory, more hope in His word, more tears in His sorrows, more pain at His grief, more meekness and trial, more praise for 
glory lead. More purity give me, more strength to overcome, more freedom from earth stains, more longings for home, more fit for the kingdom, more useful I'd be, more blessed and holy, more Savior like Thee. Our scripture reading and prayer now. Our reading tonight is from Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. That's Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've given us we're thankful for this opportunity to be able to come here, worship you, study your word, sing songs of praise. We're thankful for Luke and his song leading. We're so thankful for each and every person that is here this evening. Thankful for Bill and his lesson that he has prepared. We pray that we'll listen, study it, spread it to others, dear Lord, to help the church grow physically and spiritually. We're so thankful for your mercy and grace that you have given us. We pray for the sick, the ones that's on the sick list, that you'll heal them, give them strength if it is your will. We're thankful for the caregivers. We're so thankful for our men and women that are in the armed forces, and we pray that they'll be safe and return to their loved ones. We pray that you'll continue to bless us we ask for forgiveness of our sins, dear Lord. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Well, the song we have to lesson will be number 853, When We All Get to Heaven, in case you like to mark books. Uh, but before the lesson, we'll see number 647, Soldiers of Christ Arise. Let's stand up and sing this one together. Soldiers of Christ Arise. And we'll sing the first, second, and fifth verse of this one. We'll, we'll abbreviate it a little bit since we're small in number tonight. But let's all sing out uh, and uh, fill out this building with our singing. <clears throat> Soldiers of Christ Arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength which God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power. Who in the strength of Jesus trusts? Who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror? That having all things done and all your conflicts past, you may or come through Christ alone. You may or come through Christ alone and stand in Tyrant blast.
We certainly appreciate the attendance of all tonight. We know a lot of our families are at Hillbrook Camp. A number of our young people uh, begin a, a senior session tonight, going through Friday night. And we certainly uh, appreciate parents who care enough about their children's spiritual education to give uh, camp a chance. After having been there so many years of my life as a counselor and director, I know how helpful those can be and how a lot of can be accomplished, especially with someone who doesn't have any uh, idea about what the Lord's Church is all about. It's been great to see a number of young people baptized at camp down through the years and to follow through with that. Uh, I want to add a name to the prayer list. Uh, his name is Florin Apostu. Most of you probably know that my daughter Rachel is engaged to be married to a young man who lives in Romania. That's a long way from home here. <laughs> She's made a couple of trips over there and has uh, fallen in love with the man. They spent a lot of time uh, thankful for the internet to be able to keep in touch with each other. She's been over there twice and we'll be going again in July. But uh, Michael's father, Florent Apostu, has cancer. I'll just read the summary that she gave me, so a text to make sure I don't blow it. Uh, Michael, his, her fiancé, would appreciate prayers for his dad. He's only 51 years of age. He has stomach cancer. He's had been, been receiving IVO, IV chemotherapy for a while. Now he's on chemotherapy tablets. They're making him very sick. He's still working to pay for his treatments. So it's been very hard on him. He goes tomorrow to Bucharest, which is the capital city in R R Romania, to meet with his cancer specialist. He recently had a CT scan to see what the tumors are looking like at this time, so he'll find out tomorrow. So if you can add that name, we'll, we'll uh, put it in the bulletin next week, Florin Apostu, and hopefully um, he'll get a good report tomorrow. If not, just keep on praying for him that uh, would have a good outcome. Please get a bulletin. There are other people that need your prayerful support. Cordell's not here today because he's preparing for... Um, Colonoscopy. I think many of you know what that's about. Uh, he said it's a routine one that uh, does every three years, and so that's what that's about. And so I keep in your prayers, especially because of the news that he has the now the non Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. But formerly, it's not progressing very quickly, and hopefully, uh, uh, it'll continue to go slow and not be a problem for a while. On an April afternoon in 2008, two college women's softball teams, one from Oregon and one from Washington State, squared off. The winner would advance to the divisional playoffs. The loser would hang up the gloves and go home for the season like Tennessee is now doing. <laughs> the Western Oregon Wolves were a good softball team that had several really good batters, but Sarah Tukowski was not one of them. Her batting average was a week 153. If you know anything about baseball, that's, that's not very good. That's what my high school average was about. She was playing in the game only because the first string right fielder had blown a play earlier in the game and the coach replaced her with Sarah. Sarah had never hit a home run the whole time she ever played college softball. But on that Saturday, with two runners on base, she connected with the curveball and put it sailing over the left field fence. And her excitement... She missed first base. Her coach shouted for her to return and touch it. When she quickly turned around and started back, something popped in her knee, and down she went. She dragged herself in the dirt back to first base bag, pulled her knee to her chest in pain, and asked the first base coach, what do I do? Well, the umpire wasn't sure. He knew if any of Sarah's teammates helped her, she'd be immediately called out, and her team needed the run to win the game. Sarah knew she tried to stand. She would collapse. Her team couldn't help her. Her leg wouldn't support her. How could she cross home plate? The umpire huddled. The umpires huddled to talk. Mallory Holtman came up with a solution. She played first base on the opposing team, Central Washington University. She was a senior and she wanted the victory. A loss would end her season, the last season she would have playing college softball. You would think that Mallory would be happy for the umpire to nullify the home run, but she asked the umpire, can I help her around the bases? Well, the obvious question was, why would you want to do that? The umpire shrugged and said, go ahead. 
So Mallory did. She signaled for the shortstop to help her, and the two girls walked towards the injured player on the other team. Mallory told Sarah, we're going to pick you up and carry you around the bases. By this time, tears started streaming down Sarah's face. She, in amazement, said, thank you. Mallory and her friend put one hand under Sarah's legs, the other around Sarah's arms. The mission of mercy began. They passed long enough at second base and third base to lower Sarah's foot to touch the bases. By the time they headed home, all the spectators in the stands were standing and applauding this good sportsmanship. Sarah's teammates had gathered at home plate, and Sarah was smiling like a homecoming queen. Well, should she have been smiling, the only one who could help did help. And because she helped, Sarah made it home. That's a great story, isn't it? I saw that in the YouTube video years ago and saw it come up in a, in a preacher's outline book that I found out. Helping someone make it home. I'm preaching today. Because our Lord and Savior job on this earth was to come and help us make it home. What I want to do tonight is just go through a summary, if you will, of some verses that were very instrumental uh, years ago in my decision to become a, a gospel preacher. Just looking at some verses that stand out about, about Jesus and his amazing life. So get your Bibles out. We're going to look at quite a few verses and just read the account of the one who, who came to, to take us home. Now, we've, we've all fallen, not because of a busted knee. We've all fallen because of sin. We can never make it home on our own. But because Jesus came, he is willing to help us to get home. Let's begin in the book of Luke, chapter 1. Beginning in verse 26. And reading down through verse 38. The story of our Lord who helps us to get home. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, and there on the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting was this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great. and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you, there, you therefore. Also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. We know from scriptures that our God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, fashioned the plan of redemption even before the world was spoken into existence. The God had made the decision to make us all free moral agents. We'd be made in the image of God, but we would give the freedom to choose the path that we would take in life. And God, knowing that we would eventually choose sin and be broken in sin because of that, there would be a, a means, there should be a means necessary to atone for that. And so that they developed the plan of redemption that we began to reveal uh, through the conversation that the angel Gabriel had with Mary. Now think about this. This, was no, this would be nothing like the writers in Hollywood for a script. Here is God coming in the flesh, born of someone that would be considered a nobody, someone who was young and aged, betrothed to a man. Our, our God and our Savior would come and be born like we would be born. Conceived differently though, but have a, an earthly mother 
and would be born as a child, as we all have had the experience, and grow up as a human being. That should impress people. And that does impress people. I know it impressed me, always has, since I've been old enough to care about what the Bible had to say. To know that God in his wisdom would choose that one of those personalities would come to the earth and take on the form of a, of a servant, a human being, and walk in our shoes and be able to, because of that, to, to be able to gain our attention and to listen closely to the plan that he's made. In chapter 2, verse 1, Let's read through, through verse 20 about what happened now. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that's come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this Christ. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Here is seen so many other aspects of the, of the wisdom of God. Now, if Hollywood had written the script and learned men, as they would call themselves, there is no way they would ever have the Son of God born in a manger in a cattle feeding trough wrapped in swaddling clothes, which basically rags. So for the very first time that human eyes beheld the Son of God, look at the circumstance where he was found. Look at his poor parents. So they would be taking the child back to a city called Nazareth, which was a despised city. Jesus' earthly father Joseph was just a mere carpenter. And there he would be raised in humble circumstances. And the whole birth just shows the humble circumstances by which God said, this is the place, this is the time, this is how it will start. The very first time human eyes will lay upon the Son of God, look at the surroundings, and there's a message in that. There's a message that God will love all people. He will not just favor the rich the powerful, those who are connected. He would favor all people. That's the reason why he chose Mary. The reason why he would have Joseph be his earthly father. It's the reason why he would be raised in a town called Nazareth, which would be a despised place. Now, initially we know they had to flee and go into Egypt of all places. And then they fulfilled a prophecy, out of Egypt I've called my son. And there our Lord would grow up. And if you look at verse 52 of that chapter, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. This is how God does things. This is our God reaching out to all of humanity. He wouldn't come riding a big horse, born of the, of the connected in Jerusalem. He'd be born in, 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 a, in a small place, at a place where no one would ever want to have a child to be born because that's the way God deals with things. There's a message in that, as we said. If you turn with me to the book of John, chapter 1, we get 
a summary event, if you will, of Jesus' existence, how it began, where he was, the work that he had to do prior to becoming a Savior on earth. Begin reading with me at John chapter 1, verse 1. John 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. Without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. Look at verse 11, a sad verse. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So the verses we read thus far, we see the angel Gabriel's visit to Mary. We see Jesus' humble birth. We see shepherds, the one that God chose to make known uh, his birth, to announce that. And as we've said before in Bible classes and sermons, shepherds would be the last group of people that most people would use to herald an event. In some times, in some courts, they would even allow shepherds to be witnesses in a court of law. But God chose shepherds, common, everyday, ordinary men to go out in the highways and byways and tell the good men, tell people what had happened. And here we see a summary in the Gospel of John about where Jesus was, that he was God in the flesh, but he became flesh. that We might behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And here we see again God's wisdom. We see God in His fullness, and if you turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 1, it's another great passage that gives us some insight as to what Jesus was and what His mission was in coming to the earth. Colossians chapter 1. Read with me verses 15 down through verse 22. Who was Jesus prior to coming to the earth? What position did He have? What was His purpose? Colossians 1 verse 15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things consist. And He's the head of the body. The church, who's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things they may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Him all the fullness should dwell, and by Him to reconcile all things to Himself. By Him were the things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of His cross. And you who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now He is reconciled in the body of His flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in His sight. So here we see uh, further details about the role. We see what Jesus was, the preeminent one, We see that he would be God in the flesh, have all the characteristics of the Godhead, but in bodily form. Now we know that he humbled himself, limited certain things, he came to this earth, but here when we see Jesus, we can have an idea of what God thinks. Now to me, it's still amazing as you read the Old Testament characters like David to see the love that they have for the Lord. 
But how much easier is it for us today to read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John and some of the passages that we've read and more and see who our Savior is, the one who is there to carry us home, the one who was the bright part of heaven and came to this earth, and here we see in this passage, to atone. He would be the, the gift that, God, that heaven would send to be able to pay the sin debt that would enable us to be reconciled. Turn with me now to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Here in this verse, this chapter, we see more information about how the nature of Jesus coming, what he came to do, and the love that would be seen, the love that would be offered, the sacrifice that would be made. Romans chapter 5, begin reading with me at verse 6. For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we should be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. So here we see more uh, items about the plan of redemption, the atonement, that when man had lost all hope, the greatest hope of all, Jesus came and died for all people, not just the good folks, but died for sinners. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a, a one verse reading that helps us sum up what his life would do and what his death would do. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, look at verse 21. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. For he made him who knew, sin, who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Here's a very revealing verse about what the plan of redemption involves. Here's Jesus full of righteousness. And on the cross, he took our place. He paid our sin debt. We give him our sins. He tasted the death. He was there alone, cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he had our sins on him at that time. And he had to handle that horrible death alone, paying our sin debt. We give him our sins, we're redeemed, he gives us righteousness. The greatest transaction in all of history is something that had to be done. The blood had to be shed to reconcile all aspects of, of God's nature. And then as we begin to close, the book of Hebrews chapter 4, a passage read earlier. Hebrews chapter 4, now where he sits, what's his work? How does he deal with people? Verse 14, Hebrews chapter 4, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let's hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When I was growing up as a teenager, this was one of my favorite passages. It tells us something about the nature of our Lord. Now, we were impressed, no doubt, as we started out the story about that, that first baseman on that college softball team, who saw here's a girl who hit a home run who deserved to win. She couldn't finish out the run, couldn't move. And as an act of good sportsmanship, she and another teammate carried her around the bases to do something she could not do on her own to get her home. And he used that as an illustration of what the Lord does. What is his, basically his mission to one day, as we mentioned this morning, to get us home. It's been my privilege now to be a gospel preacher for 38 years. It's been my privilege to baptize a number of people in the baptistry behind me and baptize all over in a number of states. It's been your privilege as a Christian to be able to wear his name. We have the greatest Savior in all the world. We have the greatest religion in all the world. 
But what we need to do is make sure others get the chance to hear that, to see that. And for those people who need forgiveness, which all are due, all of us have fallen on the field of life. All of us are broken. None of us can make it home on our own. No one can ever say enough prayers or give enough money or do enough good deeds to be able to earn the right to go home to heaven, be with the Heavenly Father. No one ever has the right to do that or can earn that. But Jesus had to come here to take us there. How blessed we are. These may seem like simple things, but this is the message our world needs to hear, it needs to hear clearly. So if somebody wanted to sum up, what did he do? <laughs> he came to carry us home. What a blessed privilege we have to wear his name Christian. And therefore we've got a, an opportunity and a privilege and a responsibility to make known this great plan of salvation to people as best we can. Let me encourage you, if you had the opportunity, and hopefully you'll take that, to find somebody that was finally interested, young or old, who came to you and saying, you know, I don't know very much about Christianity. I know I don't like seeing what's going on in the world. What is it about Christianity that appeals to you? Would you be able to answer that? A summary here, here's just some verses that stood out to me early on in my life as a teenager. And things that have always been there that helped convince me to become a gospel preacher and remain one all of these years. How blessed it is to know that the greatest entity, the greatest power, the greatest man, the greatest God in all the world came here 2,000 years ago so that we could go home there throughout eternity. This evening, if you're not a Christian, what a great song when we all get to heaven. That was made possible. We can get there and have that as our heavenly home because of the gift that Jesus paid that we've talked about tonight. He paid our sin debt. He became sin on our behalf. He might take our sins and we might be considered righteous for what we did if we obey. Now, the passage we didn't read, Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, talks about Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Now, that's our part. We focused on that pretty much clearly on what Jesus did. Now what do we do in response? Obey his will. Respond to the gospel. To the gospel call and have our sins washed away. We've done that already. Or if we have in times past done that but slipped back. Not as faithful as we need to be. We have the opportunity to make things right. Right now together we stand and sing. Will you come? of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansion, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day, what a day that will be when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sign. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Again, uh, the next session of the marriage enrichment classes, so we encourage you to come. We'll be talking about the importance of communication in marriage. There are love languages. 
Now, there's a writer who wrote a book, taught detail in some of those languages, that knowing that, I guarantee you would help you. So if you have a perfect marriage, don't worry about coming. But if it's not, maybe we can help make your marriage better than what it is. So, and those of you that are doing well, you can share some insights into why you are doing so well. The rest of us will need that. Thank you. I believe we have members that need to partake of the Lord's Supper tonight. All right. now let's sing number 374. There is a fountain. It's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. So Bill brought us a lesson about the nature of Christ and uh, some of the aspects of his sacrifice. So let's sing this together and reflect as we, prepare, as we have the Lord's Supper still prepared for those who need it. <clears throat> There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners what beneath the flood lose all their guilty sins. Lose all their guilty sins. Lose all their guilty saints and sinners wash beneath their flood, lose all their guilty saints. Dear dying Lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. Till all the ransomed church of God be safe to sin no more. Be safe to sin no more. Be safe to sin no more. Till all the ransomed church of God be safe to sin no more. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, the flowing words of life. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. It shall be till I die, and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme, and shall be till I die. The Lord's table has been left prepared for those that was unable to be here this morning. If you would, raise your hand. If you don't have a cup, someone will bring it to you. If you do, uh, let's, let us pray for the bread. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and for all the many blessings that you've given us, Father. We thank you for this bread which represents to us this, <clears throat> the body of your Son who died upon the cross. Father, please be with the ones that partake of it tonight, and may they partake of it in a manner that will be well-pleasing to thee. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Bow with me while we pray for the cup. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, the fruit of the vine, which represents to us the blood of, that was shed by thy Son on the cross. And through this blood, we have our salvation, Father. Please let us remember that as we go through our life and be with the ones who partake of this tonight. And may they do so in a manner be pleasing to thee. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I have two baskets, one on each side of the door. Let us pray for a contribution. Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for all the many blessings that you've given us. And Father, there, there are numerous that 
you know, the air we breathe, the homes we have, the cars we drive. And Father, for the money that we make as we do our, <clears throat> do our work, and Father, please be with us and, and, and let us be a cheerful giver and give you back some, a portion of which that, to help spread thy kingdom at this church. And be with the ones that give and may they do cheerfully. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, good to be here. Glad to see everybody that's made it tonight. Appreciate everybody setting aside the time to come here and, and worship and study and to encourage each other. In just a minute, we're going to be dismissed in prayer. Let's sing number 410, He Leadeth Me. We'll sing the first and third verses, and let's stand and sing this together. So as we go back into our lives to work, family, school, wherever we're going, let's remember who needs to be leading us, who we need to walk with as we encounter um, everything in our life. Let's sing, He Leadeth Me together, and then we'll be dismissed in prayer. <clears throat> he leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, for by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won. In death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Let us go to Heavenly Father in prayer. O oh Lord, as once more we come before the Almighty Throne, we thank Thee for this day Thou hast given us to study, to get to come together, to study from Thy Word and Spirit and truth. And we pray, Father, that the seed sown in the day is fell upon fertile ground, will become a great blessing to Thee, that it will be a shining beacon in a lost and dying land, that many souls come to Thee before it's everlasting too late. We pray for those who are absent from our midst, Father, whatever the reason may be, if they be traveling, we pray Thou give them safe journeys, they may be out because of illnesses, Father. We would pray that Thou would be with them, restore them to the much wanted health, be with Thy will, that they can soon be back among us. And Father, we pray for Rachel's fiance's husband. Father, we pray that if Thou would show mercy upon him, and let the doctors be able to cure him of his cancer, Father, we pray this mightily. But Father, we know that You can do all things. We must have the utmost faith. And Father, we pray as we depart and go many separate ways that we always look to Thee from guidance, that we do what is right in Thy sight, that when we reach the last mile of the way, we'll have peace everlasting with Thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs>